Hello and welcome to our next session. I'm Anna Delaney with ISMG. The title of this session is Cloud Identity and Access Management, Enlightenment or BS. Is Cloud IAM the best identity and access control ever? Or one more reason to tear your hair out in frustration? Well, to tackle this question head on are Jeremy Snyder, Senior Director of Solutions Engineering, and Alex Kostorfin, Senior Solutions Engineer from Divi Cloud by Rapid7. And at this point, it's over to you, Jeremy and Alex. Thank you so much, Anna. We're delighted to be here today to talk about this very important topic. I know something that's probably front of mind for any of today's audience that is think either thinking about making a shift to the cloud or already in the process of making that move. Um, so yeah, very, very timely, very important, especially in the days of remote work with this mass migration to the cloud that we're seeing right now. Um, so I want to start by just kind of giving a quick background on myself and Alex and, and you know, why we're here today and, you know, potentially what qualifies us to have this conversation with our audience today. So uh, myself, I'm the Senior Director of Solutions Engineering here. And over the last 10 years, I've devoted my entire career effectively to public cloud. Um, you know, I spent some time with one of the major cloud providers, opening up territories around the world, helping customers embrace cloud for the very first time and start to make that move over. And, you know, since then, I've gone on to work elsewhere in the ecosystem, not only at Divi Cloud and Rapid7, but prior to that, also with a service provider that helped companies make the migration. So I spent a lot of time kind of from the service provider perspective and from the enablement perspective. And I think Alex, uh, you know, with his background, coming from the past several years of working specifically in the security software space might bring a slightly different perspective to the table, helping customers navigate some of the challenges that they do encounter with that migration. So hopefully we'll be able to bring a little bit of a, a you know, maybe two kind of uh, different perspectives to the conversation and, and share what we can from that time. Um, so Alex, let's get things started here and let's, let's kind of talk about, you know, what the challenges are around uh, cloud identity and you know what this all means and, and before we dive into the to the identity specific side of it i wanted to uh, take a second to kind of talk about the overall shift to the cloud and some of the things that you've experienced uh and seen with customers over the last several years it looks to me like one of the things that um that's highlighted here on this slide is really the risk created by the pace of innovation and disruption and i wondered if you could just take a minute and kind of explain what's meant by that and why that is something that is impacting organizations in this shift to the cloud. Yeah, yeah, I think the overall challenge is that everything is moving faster. And you know, there's been an old adage of move fast and break things. We just need to go, we're gonna develop however we need, get this done, get the product shipped, get it developed. And the challenge is that that's absolutely an option now. People can move almost as fast as they want. But the challenge is that now, as the speed of development is being increased, the opportunity for, uh, to, for mistakes is so much higher because you don't have to take your time in order to do things. And so overall, people are kind of looking at this now saying, okay, this is great that we need to go fast, but maybe there's a balance that we need to find in order to kind of rein this in and make sure that even though we're going faster, we can still make sure we're doing it in the right way. Yeah, and is there something specific to cloud that's making that pace different from what it might have been? Because I think about, you know, new technology adoption is not a new thing. That's something that every company over the last, you know, 20, 30 years has faced. But what is it about cloud that's made that a particularly unique set of challenges? Uh, accessibility. Okay. You know, just thinking just on the standard uh, kind of compute. If back in the day I needed to go and put in a request to go have a server provision and, and racked and cabled and everything, this takes time and there's going to be a lot of visibility on it. And um, and now instead, you know, even if I can't get the okay, I can slap down a, a credit card and spin up an instance within seconds. Got and so the, the time it takes to do the same thing is uh, just dramatically lower. Yeah, yeah, I can understand in a lot of organizations where there are established security processes, the ability for somebody to just go create something on the fly very quickly could pose a challenge. So I, I, I get what you're saying there. And is that also something that you think is, is true relative to cloud identity? Is that something that is also kind of changing rapidly and something that people can go and modify quickly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, not just from a from a permission standpoint, as far as who can make these changes, um, but also what these changes are in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, if I've got my data center, you, as you can see in this picture here, have a very specific 
uh, you know, set of kind of gates that I need to lock down in order to ensure that my walls are locked in. Mm -hmm. It's just not the, that's just not the case anymore. There's so many different challenges and places that I can go expose things. The yeah. network side hasn't gone away, but now there's just a whole new world on top of that other, of other places to potentially add value, but more likely to get things wrong. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to dive into a lot of that detail in, a, in just a second here. But I was curious about something on here, you know, this idea that identity is the cloud perimeter. I mean, if I take it back for a second, and I think about how we've been doing things before cloud, right? So before my time in the cloud over the last 10 years, you know, I ran data centers worldwide for a couple of SaaS companies and some online game companies. And, you know, we had a strong focus on perimeter security, mostly built around our firewall, right? So we would put one or more firewalls in place at the edge of our network. We use those to deny access to any bad actors trying to get into our networks. And, and that was all kind of fine. You know, we, we understood that process. We understood how to protect our networks at the edge. We understood, you know, maybe even a couple steps behind that, where to put security controls in place. And I'm wondering why people are thinking of identity as the new perimeter instead of sticking with a network kind of a network defined perimeter when it comes to cloud and wondering, you know, what is it about identity in your mind that makes it kind of a, a, a candidate to be viewed as the perimeter on, on cloud computing? Yeah, I think it's that, let's say we took this exact same model of not even talking about accessory services, but just standard compute and networking. Mm -hmm. If you rubber stamp that and put that in your cloud environment, that's fine. Okay, I've got this perimeter. I've locked down that same sort of network traffic that I had historically. But with all these IAM permissions, if I've got, if, if a IAM permission or user or role gets compromised, then it doesn't matter how perfect my environment is because someone can come in over the top and change anything they want. And so that, that ability to be kind of that root level, um, you know, admin to make all these changes can really nullify all of the good work you've done um, if there's you know a bad compromise in the wrong place. Got it. So it sounds like kind of what you're saying is that great. I can do what I whatever I want to do at the network layer, but if I've got identity access, there's ways for me to go around the network configuration, whether that's like direct to the public cloud provider API or what have you, in order to kind of get the access I'm looking for as a bad actor. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. Gotcha, gotcha. So I, I get then, you know, why people are saying identity is the cloud perimeter that kind of makes sense. So I think about, you know, during my time working in the public cloud, identity is something that was introduced because prior to the system that we have today with identity and access management, and I'll just kind of pick on AWS as a provider uh, example, prior to IAM, there was exactly one set of credentials and those were the root credentials. And everybody, again, knew how to manage those root credentials. But I think that the shift towards cloud identity, in my mind, has actually brought a lot of power. And I'll take the, the enlightenment side of the, of the argument, if you will. I'll say that cloud identity is amazing, right? Because if I look at this diagram here, and I know this may be a little bit difficult for our audience to view on the screen, but just know I've taken this directly from the AWS website. So this is a, you know, a public image that anybody can go examine in detail. If I look at the principles here, which is to say, let's say me as a user, and I look through anything that I'm trying to do, so that second part of the screen, the request bit here, I look through the author authorization, I look through the, um, the analysis of my access, I see a huge number of different controls that to me really allow for almost any scenario or any kind of permutation for how I might want to either allow or restrict access and to me, I, I view that as a good thing because that is super powerful. It allows me maximum flexibility, maximum power. And it also doesn't mean that I have to kind of force all my users into various different models. It really means that I can treat Alex with exactly the level of access that Alice needs or Anne with what she needs and so on. So why is that a bad thing? I think about it like buying a car to commute to work. You could buy a Civic, or I could give you a couple boxes of bolts that if assembled can make a Ferrari. Civic is going to get me there. It works. It's fine. It's my root equivalent. If I assemble my Ferrari, it's going to take more time. I'm probably going to get it wrong. If I get it right, sure, things will be good and I'll be getting there faster and in style. But instead, when I get it wrong and I'm broken down on the side of the uh, side of the road, I'm, I'm going, to, uh, <laughs> going to wish I want something a little bit simpler. And so I think it's 
I think it's the same here where the opportunity to have a extremely locked down and uh, utopian I am uh, set up is, is available. But the reality and the likelihood of actually being able to get it right and not misconfigure mm -hmm. anything and get to least privilege and all of that is just not the reality that I've actually seen. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you're saying, you know, really one of the key risks is that the opportunity for human error in configuring things is just that much higher than it would have be without, without IAM in, at all or, or what? No, no, I think IAM overall is important. I think going back to just root credentials is probably not the best approach either, but I think that in, you know, as, as these different IAM services have been built out, there's so many different layers of complexity that have been added over the years that you've ended up with this hodgepodge of different permissions that has kind of turned into a, a monster to manage. So I think somewhere in the middle where we can still go and make sure that we've got their appropriate permissions locked down um, for the right users is still very important. I just think the most often implementations you see of that has, has gone away from that. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm glad you bring up that hodgepodge of different kind of permission models, because that's really where I want to take the conversation next. I think, you know, from the standpoint of traditional role-based access control, everybody's familiar with users, groups, roles, and maybe even having permission sets separated from roles, although I know in a lot of environments, kind of roles and permission sets are the same thing. Um, I wanted to talk about kind of the next wave of cloud what would you call it, roles? What would you call it here when you think about things not being tied to a user anymore, but now being tied to a resource? What would you call that? Yeah, I mean, I think roles is appropriate. I think uh, in kind of longer form, I call it users without people. Um, maybe not as you know, catchy, but it's, it's yeah, what, how do we give system permissions? Mm -hmm. And what's the point of giving systems permissions instead of having it tied to users? We don't always need users to uh, to be able to do things. Um, say I've got a you know I've got a server over here and I've got storage over here. Mm -hmm. If I don't have any of these permission, if I don't have any permissions management at all, then all servers could hit all storage. Yeah. If I instead needed a user, I'm going to have you know someone whose full time job is to sit on this instance and and have the permissions, which probably isn't a great use of their time. And so instead, being able to say this service can access that service using a specific set of credentials, um, again, on paper is a nice way to, to make sure that we're limiting access to just where it should be. So it sounds like kind of the evolution of service accounts from the good old days. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. But with or without passwords? Well, um, I, kinda, I think at the end of the day, if, if there's a password, but you still have to bake it into the system, then then either way, you haven't really added an extra layer of security. Okay. Uh, if I, yeah, if, if we need something to work without a user input, then whatever state it ends up being left in to allow those permissions kind of needs to be set up good to go. And what's the standard configuration for these, you know, users without users, as you called them, or, or users without humans? Is the standard set up nowadays to have passwords or, or not to have passwords? Not to have passwords. So yeah, so right. users without users or roles, we attach that on. So once you've got those permissions, you've just got them. Okay. So again, I mean, to me, this sounds fantastic. I, I, you know, I don't have passwords to manage. I don't have to worry about a service account creation. You know, I, I it sounds like utopia again to me, Alex. Where, 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 like, are there any real world examples of where this has gone wrong? Yeah, um, I think the Capital One breach from, was that last year? Is, is mm -hmm. a pretty big highlight of that. We had you know, roles provisioned that allowed a certain instance to, I think it was only supposed to do a handful of things, but first off, the role was over provisioned because again, it's so hard to manage this at scale. Mm -hmm. But now on top of that, I've got this essentially passwordless permission attached to this instance. And my new perimeter on top of everything else is that now, if the instance is compromised, as it was, people don't need any password or anything. And once they've got control of an instance, they can then go on wherever they want, which ended up uh, resulting in a pretty massive data breach. 
Gotcha, gotcha. I'm glad you bring up that point around scale, and I want to come back to that in a minute. But I think you know, I've I've understood here what your let's say what your complaint is relative to uh, machine or resource based roles or users without users, as you uh, as you put it. Um, but let's let's talk for a second about you know I want to come back to kind of my argument that you know IAM is fantastic or or is is a very enlightened approach because. You know, this diagram here um, expresses to me one of the main things that I think uh, is important to understand. So, you know, we've looked at this in coming from, okay, identity-based policy and standard role-based access controls. We've come at this from kind of the resource-based policy like we were just talking about a minute ago. Um, there's two other concepts that I want to touch on here, you know, service control policies, which I understand are a construct kind of at the highest level within within let's say an organization or a company that is adopting AWS uh, in particular, but could be other cloud providers as well. Talk to me a minute about what that is and then, you know, and then we'll come back and continue on this discussion. Yeah, I think service control policies are, are one of the few times I'll be agreeing with you today in the, uh, the enlightenment side of things. I think they're, they're a pretty great construct that brings some of that simplicity back into things that we've been missing. Um, okay. You know what they are for anyone who, who isn't aware is again they're that top-down permission but they work as denies so they okay. say okay you should never be able to run services in any region besides the one that we've called okay and you can only use these 20 services that you know the company has given the thumbs up for and no others um, you know that maybe have just been released and haven't been vetted by security and so being able to do that at that top-down way is a great way to kind of blanket enforce your policies um, without having to get into the weeds of, of stacking all these other permissions. So these are like my good old firewall deny any any rules that I can then go make you know exceptions to here and there. Mm -hmm. Got yeah, it, and, it. and there's not as much granularity as you would get into again in some of the lower ones, but considering the service control policies are generally for those very hard and fast rules that we don't want exceptions for, um, yeah. that helps, uh, makes it okay that they might be slightly more brittle than the lower level constructs. Got it. So to me, again, you know, this adds like yet another layer of possible control and security, which sounds like a great thing. And then, you know, when I combine those three things together, I think, you know, the Venn diagram here does a nice job of showing that we've got effective access calculated at the middle of that, which is really very powerful to the extent that I can, again, allow for any kind of combination of, of different criteria. And you'll notice, you know, if I look around the edges of this central effective access, if I've got things that don't involve a service control policy, I can still take into account the resource, the identity and the permissions boundaries. If I've got things that don't have identity-based policies, you know, that just straddle the line between permissions boundaries and service control policies, I've again got really like all the different kind of variables taken into account. Plus what we didn't really talk about was the wild cards and the conditionals here. So this, this again, this, you know, just appeals to me as somebody who likes to have a lot of control over my environments and likes to have a lot of granularity for how I configure things. And I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, like where in the real world does this turn out to be difficult to manage? Is it, is it scale? Is it complexity? Is it some of both? Or what's, what is like the kind of the day-to-day -day problems that this poses? Yeah, it, it's all of the above. Um, you know, looking at them as colored circles and seeing a middle of effective access is good, but you know, this all just gets exponentially harder as it scales. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I have, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of resources across hundreds or thousands of accounts, with hundreds or thousands of users, I have to, you know, for any very specific question I wanna ask, say, okay, well, take this user and this resource and look at all these other policies and start to, and start to bring it together to start to walk down this line of, okay, what is that effective access? But yeah. just doing that for one user and one, um, you know, one resource is hard. Doing this at scale it becomes even harder to the point where you can't just say, hey, are things good? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's such a hard to calculate and, and sometimes nebulous question. Yeah, and you know, I, I kind of flipped slides as you were going through it there because I think you were starting to get into exactly what this represents. So this is, 
you know, if I look at this left to right, as the arrows suggest, it looks like I've got to go through one, two, three, four, five, six different, I, I, I don't know, like if I think of this as a flow chart, I'm going through like six different dis decision points where I'm trying to calculate, you know, yes, no, true, false. And, um, and, I, and bringing it to what you were just talking about, if there are customers with hundreds of accounts, you know, that can be potentially difficult. What, what's involved in one account? You know, what does that give me as a customer? If I create a new AWS account, again, just to kind of pick on them as the cloud provider, does that give me a certain number of IAM resources? Is it unlimited? How, how does that look out of the box? Yeah, so out of the box, you're going to have one user, which is your root user, which if we're you know, following kind of those basic best practices, we'll essentially take those credentials and lock them away in a safe and never touch them again. We can then create users, um, or hopefully and more likely we'll create roles that users can then assume, which is again a whole nother uh, kind of dimension to deal with on the permissions management. Then on the policy piece, um, Amazon ships with about, I think it's 500-ish pre-canned policies um, that you can use to get started, but then from there you can create, um, I don't know if it's exactly unlimited, but let's call it unlimited amounts of policy. Effectively unlimited. Yeah, to um, then you know, scope down access just the way you want it. And then within any of those custom policies, then you can also get into those wild card and uh, conditional wrenches that we were looking at in that last right. slide. Right, right. Um, and so, yeah, just, just top to bottom, there are so many knobs to turn, even on a brand new account. And if we think about kind of, you know, not only the left to right of this policy evaluation that we have on the screen here right now, but if we think about the left to right of, you know, users, groups, roles, and policies, and then permission sets, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, right? It's kind of, it can be many-to-many -many at almost any, uh, any step along the way. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. It, you know, it can kind of come back on itself too. Like if we have server role permission and then a user over here that might have a different role, but they mm -hmm. compromise another instance and then therefore they get a role and then they can come in from the side. Um, yeah, many to many is, is definitely a good way to put it. Gotcha, yeah. So I guess like, all right, I think I might be coming a little bit over onto your side. I still think it's super powerful and gives me all the flexibility that I want to really cater to almost any user or any use case that I can think of but I'm starting to understand, you know, why people view this as being so hard. I guess in summing up, you know, is there anything, you know, we've captured a whole bunch of different things on this slide here, which, um, you know, for anybody who's interested, we will make the slides available for download. So don't feel like you need to try to screenshot or, or try to copy or take notes or anything. But I guess are, are there any kind of like last points around real world customers that you've been working with where you think it, it really becomes particularly painful or, or do you think we've kind of hit the high points? I, again, I think we've hit the highlights. I think just as that theme, the more complexity, the harder this is to manage and the bigger the problem becomes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, let's go through a couple kind of common questions that I've heard and, you know, I'll kind of tee up the question here and ask you to, you know, very briefly kind of talk around a best practice or something that you've learned over the last four years on how to address it. So if I've got the challenge of, you know, decentralized management, what's, you know, what's a quick, quick win here? Yeah, um, I think alerting is the big one. Um, okay. If people start to make changes and we don't know about it, then we can't do anything about it. And as we've talked about, auditing after the fact can be much harder. Um, but then additionally, having the tools for visibility to help with that audit, which inevitably we will still want. Um, yep. We'll bring those two together. Got it. Well, you were just talking about auditing. So I was, you know, the next challenge was no awareness of the abuse. Um, sounds like you've kind of already hit that one. And I guess uh, anything to add real quick on that point? No, I think, think I hit it. Cool. Um, Self-escalation. What, what, what about that? Yeah. Um, this is <laughs> another big one where basically if I don't give a user a whole bunch of permissions, but I give a couple key ones, it allows them to grant themselves more permissions, eventually, essentially just giving themselves the keys to the kingdom. And so least privilege access is really probably the number one goal. It's the hardest thing to manage because again, we want to have as little access as possible while still being able to let people do their jobs. But wherever possible is a number one theme 
always try for least privilege access wherever possible. Got it. Uh, no identifiable ownership. Yeah. Um, it even comes back a bit to the least privileged access. Um, people should not have access to anything more than they need. What is that? How do I know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being able to understand for a certain subset of resources, what team owns this, what's its sensitivity level, what should it be doing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of those things can really be helped by tagging and, and really help, not even just with IEM, but overall having a better understanding on how these environments are set up. Got it. Got it. How about uh, how about this ongoing justification question? Because I know you know we hear a lot about the cloud being elastic, and you can use things for as long or as short a time period as you as you need. Um, you know, what's the best practice here? Yeah, I um, I think this topic actually comes up a lot in like managing cloud cloud costs, um, which is a whole nother topic. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, if I spin up resources I don't need anymore, and I walk away from, and they sit orphaned and kind of neglected in the corner then those are most frequently the ones that have the most likelihood of, um, of being compromised. If everyone's yep. forgotten about them, they're not getting patched anymore. And again, any new holes that we poke into this perimeter that we're talking about just provide more risk. Yeah, it makes sense. Then I think, you know, last, uh, what about bad developers experience? Yeah. You know, especially with people coming from the data center, Mm -hmm. This is a new way of thinking and a new way of doing things. And if you try to do the old things in this new place, it's, it's not going to work or we're going to get this wrong. Yep. And so education top to bottom is the number one thing, not just on, hey, what should you be doing regardless of what company you work at? But then on top of that, okay, what does your company do and what, what are our policies and expectations of how you set that up? Um, education is probably the number one yeah. Um, issue that we're seeing these these configurations are not being done out of out of malice yeah 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 and then i guess uh um i am consistency yeah um, comes back a bit to the communication really set up a policy make it work for the whole the whole organization um if we yeah if we if we don't then we've got a bunch of one-off accounts doing all sorts of different things and again those are going to be ripe for misconfiguration yeah, makes sense. Well, thank you so much for that, Alex. I, I appreciate going through these, especially kind of, you know, just tactically giving some best practices for anybody in the audience today. Um, I know we're kind of running up against time here. So I just wanted to kind of throw this out for anybody who's interested, you know, Divi Cloud by Rapid7. Uh, IAM challenges is a core area that the Divi Cloud product suite can help you address in addition to uh, security configuration, monitoring, policy violations, and threat data in the cloud. Um, I want to see, Ann, I don't know if we've got time for maybe just one question or so uh, before we kind of wrap things up here. I'd love to ask you a question. Go for it. Okay, so how do you prove, validate, and provide evidence that your identity approach is, the, is, is working in the way you intend it to be working? Yeah, yeah Alex, you want to take that? Yeah, um, it's hard. And, and, you know, it comes back to that first bullet point we were talking on the last one where, you know, what do we do for audit? And, um, and you know, as, as Jeremy just mentioned, actually, in the last slide, you know, we've got an approach where we can go and hook into this, um, this IM data and start to give you more visibility. Um, because otherwise, what we've seen, uh, you know, customers do is actually shut down and have a bunch of developers try to do different things and just kind of give a thumbs up or a thumbs down of whether or not what we expected them to be able to do actually lined up with reality. Um, you know, it's a pretty, uh, let's say, impactful sort of way to do things um, or yeah, disruptive. Um, but, you know, whether it's doing that manually or leveraging a tool like Divi Cloud, um, do something. <laughs> Got it. Cool. I'll ask another one then. Are there any real world examples of resource based roles being exploited in an actual attack? Yeah, yeah, I touched on that a bit with that, the um, tap one. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> um, and, and that's, I think that was one of the interesting things, in my opinion, about that was a lot of these cloud breaches that we have seen haven't been companies really getting hacked. Essentially, they're just leaving the front door open and someone waltzes in and takes the data. And obviously, this is still a huge, a huge issue, but it's not some, you know, really multi-tiered sort of uh, incident. This was one of the very first ones and definitely the most, uh, you know, high profile where 
it was a series of very specific issues that that led to this happening. And, um, and I think really highlights that, you know, even beyond kind of getting those cloud 101 things locked down, like not exposing your buckets, we need to make sure that we're taking this further, shooting for least privilege, auditing our environments wherever we can, and additionally, adding even more security than, or scrutiny than normal to our most sensitive uh, resources. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, Alex, for playing out this really informative debate. Um, and thank you to our audience for listening. And do submit your questions to Jeremy and Alex. And enjoy the rest of the summit. Thanks, Thanks Ann. Thanks so much for having us.